Political spending is shattering records again for this year's elections. The top donor so far is Democrat billionaire George Soros. Soros has donated at least $126 million to his political action committee, Democracy PAC. The PAC dispersed about $15 million alone on this election cycle. The next two biggest donors are Republicans, Richard Uline and Kenneth Griffin. They each donated around $67 million. Open Secrets, a nonprofit group that tracks political spending, estimates that total political spending in the midterms would reach $16.7 billion by Election Day, the previous record $14 billion in 2018. But this increase is almost entirely explained by inflation. Tech workers in the country are bracing for a round of massive layoffs. Just this week alone, a handful of companies announced upcoming layoffs and hiring freezes. Hiring typically trends around how financially robust a company is and how they're feeling financially. Lyft says it would lay off roughly 13 percent of its staff, and Amazon says it'll pause corporate hiring for the next several months. And big changes coming to Twitter after Elon Musk takes over. Mass layoffs began today with reports saying up to 50 percent of employees could be laid off. But the overall job market is still trending well, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics report today. The U.S. economy added around 260,000 jobs in October. Now, this was higher than projected forecasts, but the same report also showed the U.S. unemployment rate rose to 3.7 percent. Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin won his race in Virginia last year, basing his campaign largely on parental rights. And some wonder if parents across the nation could help deliver a similar win for Republicans in Congress this year. To discuss, we're happy to have on Tamara Farah, a team member for FreedomWorks. All right, Tamara, thanks for joining me today. Um, you work for an advocacy group that aims for smaller government in many areas. Now, your focus specifically is education. Um, the government has been involved in public education for quite some time now. It seems like quite a big task to try to pull in the reins here a little bit. What exactly are you all trying to do to reduce the government's role in the classrooms? Exactly. Well, of course, with government-run public schools, um, they are in deeply involved and more so than um, many of us want right now, that is for sure. Um, and so we are working hard to put the power back in the hands of parents. Uh, there are several federal laws and many states have laws supporting parental rights in education very specifically and the involvement of parents. Even the uh, law in 1979 that established the Department of Education states clearly that it is the primary responsibility of parents to direct their child's education and it is the primary responsibility of schools in localities to support that. Um, and this takeover of schools in terms of curriculum, dictating cultural items um, is way above and beyond. And the billions and billions of dollars that the federal government has spent supposedly to increase testing uh, scores, et cetera, and student performance over the last 30 years has been a complete failure. And I think it is going to actually impact the midterms this year. Um, we are seeing that parents, when parents are polled, well, first of all, when voters are polled, we all know the answer. It's inflation uh, and the economy are the number one things on the minds of, of voters. And we've seen a 27% swing of you know suburban moms from Democrat to Republican just since August, and it's inflation and it's the economy. Everyone is concerned about that. But when you uh, look at polls of parents, a Harris poll shows 83% of voting parents say education is more important to them now than it's ever been. Um, and 62% of parents are very concerned, according to a poll by the National Parent Union, about the ability of schools to provide quality teaching and instruction. And I believe we're seeing that reflected in poor student performance. For example, ACT scores are the worst they've been in 30 years. And so, and Heritage found out that, you know, 70% of parents don't want their kids being taught about sex and sexual preferences and gender identity 
at least uh, not until fourth grade or fifth grade. So we do have a huge issue going on right now. Another poll just came out showing that around 70 percent of voters say they would not support a candidate who approves of puberty blockers for minors, with just 27 percent saying they do support minors transitioning. And that's even among Democrats. 57 percent say they don't support this, while 42 say they do support it. I want to know your reaction to this. Are you surprised at all by this or have your interactions shown you that this is the case? It, it's definitely shown us that it's the case. It, uh, these things know no party. I wonder if, you know, just from my experiences with schools and parents, if teachers even understand just even federal law around parental rights. Um, federal law supports a parent school compact that includes involvement in the classroom. And of course, under the banner of COVID, parents were not allowed in classrooms, and now they're only allowed in for certain times. And from the reports I've heard from parents, you know, it would appear they're whitewashing what's being said while the parent is there or taking certain things down from the walls, uh, you know, when the parents come in. But their federal law says that parents are allowed to sit in the classroom, are allowed to be in the classroom, participate, to be on committees and give input, have regular meaningful conversations with teachers and school officials on student progress. And they have a right, according to FERPA, to request to review all of their child's records. And that includes anything that is being written down. Speaking of that, I mean, it's notable how far we've strayed from those federal laws that are there for parents to make use of. And I want to ask you about the the values of this. You know, there are people who say that the traditional values like recognizing the inherent difference between the genders or keeping children in in a realm of innocence until a certain age, as far as teaching them about sexual activities, they would say that these traditional values are outdated or not inclusive enough. What is your response to that? Again, I don't believe it's the job of schools to render that opinion for someone else's children. So for me, it isn't just about what I believe or another parent believes or even about what a teacher believes. This discussion and this decision should revolve around the fundamental and supreme rights of parents in the lives of their children. It's according to the Protection of People Rights Amendment. It's a very specific law federal law that states that parents have the right to request to inspect all curriculum. If you had shown children some of these books that are in the classroom and, and, and in the resource center in schools, out on if you, if you were an adult and you showed that to a child, out on a sidewalk, you could be arrested for obscenity. And so, you know, we're just in a very bizarre time right now. And I think that parents just need to continue to push back Right. Very eye-opening information. Thank you for those specifics and your insight into this. We appreciate your time, Tamara. Thank you so much for having me. And the Department of Homeland Security is ramping up safety efforts for the midterm elections. This follows last week's warning from federal officials about the potential for violence. The DHS has been pushing out warnings to state and local law enforcement authorities. Officers across the country are on the lookout for threats to election officials and vandalism of ballot boxes. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said that one of the greatest terrorism-related threats to the U.S. is homegrown. However, Homeland Security officials have not identified any specific threats. Deaths caused by alcohol spiked in the U.S. during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to CDC data published on Friday. The agency found that alcohol-induced deaths jumped by 26% between 2019 and 2020, killing more than 49,000 people in 2020. Alcoholic liver disease was the underlying cause in more than half of those deaths, followed by mental and behavioral disorders from alcohol. The CDC's analysis only included deaths where alcohol was the only factor and excluded ones where it was one of many direct factors. Lighter mornings and darker evenings are on the way as daylight savings time comes to an end this weekend. At 2 a.m. Sunday, U.S. clocks will turn back one hour and revert to standard time, shifting sunrise and sunset an hour earlier and ushering in four plus months of darker winter evenings. 
It comes as lawmakers debate whether the practice should be eliminated. The Senate approved the bipartisan Sunshine Protection Act in March, which would make daylight savings time permanent. But the bill has stalled in the House.